Hi guys! Oops, sorry, I'm diddling dawdling along. I, um, I'm still fiddling in front with this. Hi! How are you doing? I am, I am, as you can see, I'm doing a bit of coding. This, this is the code here, and, um, this is what's coming out. And what I'm building is for all of my websites. It's a reference that I'm going to use. So all the stuff that I need to know without all the stuff that I don't need to know in one little kinda book. And it teaches me the shades. And I put in, pre put in all the stuff that I all the colors that I use and all that kind of stuff without having to redo it and that's kind of what I've been fiddling with and uh, so I don't have to keep going back and forth and back and forth I just know where to go and most of it's already set up so that it does what I want it to do so I don't have to it's so I don't have to fiddle and fart around so yay I do it's the HTML and CSS for the websites and then of course all the crafting and actually my hands are cold Ooh. so I'm and my arthritis has been bad lately so I'm sitting on my bed and uh, my back is against a big pile of pillows oops a little too far and um, yeah so you know um, leaning on a big pile of pillows helps the arthritis. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I, I don't know which, well, I do sort of know which books I'm playing today. They are, um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, a spectral collie, a color in a night, and a secret of two plaster cats. Ooh. Um, it's um, it's the place I get the uh, links from is uh, LibriVox, Streamlabs, YouTube. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and yes, I have automatic responses set up. <laughs> So yeah, this is this is my uh, crafting channel. Usually I have this camera that's being used on my face, on my hands, but I'm not sitting at my desk because my back goes to bed. So I figured I might as well do this instead. So yay! You can see here's my nice little bit of code. This is the whole thing that I just showed you in the other part. And it looks like it's formatting it nicely too, which is good because I, I hate unformatted stuff, but it's hard to format. Uh, cool, it looks like it's, it actually looks like it formatted it nicely. Ooh, pretty. It's just I don't have a thing to show Yes, <laughs> coding's just fine, honey. Hi, Brooke. I came and watched your show for a little bit, but since you become famous, you, you haven't been by to say hi to me. <laughs> oh, you forgot to say hi, <laughs> and I was crying. And <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> and, and and the and and the uh, award for the best actress goes to. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> I know, Brooke. I don't mind. I don't. I know you're. I like to see you when you're here, and I know you can't always make it. So, it's, but it's always good when you do.
Yeah, and I'll try to I'll try to th throw in another another day so that we can, um, because I can't get my recording to work right. It's it's stuttery. Um. And um, so I can't record in Linux. It's just not working. So once I get everything set up for the website, I'm going to be uh, live streaming my tutorials instead. Um, I haven't seen drafting in a while, and Josiah is working again tonight. <laughs> he seems to be working mostly when it's during my streams. <laughs> woe is woe is me. Okay, well we'll have to do something on Saturdays. Maybe I'll start up my other channel. I've been trying to get the um um live streaming to work. And it's not. Uh like to do um to do video calls. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he hasn't been by. I've had a stalker. I'm, I'm wondering if it was him um, that has showed up during the streams. I, d I don't know. Um, uh, oh, there's five people here. Ooh, I'm, I'm famous and popular. Oh. And and I'm foolish too. If nobody's if nobody's figured that out, I'm I'm quite foolish. Um, you know, just just in case you guys didn't know already, I am. Um, and uh, yeah, but yeah, no, we've been we've been working along and and and. Uh, oops, I didn't want to do that. I did not want to do that. Here, open up. Ah, you little bastard. I don't want you to go closed all ah fuck whatever. Um <laughs> and I swore Oh I'm not supposed to swear on this channel because it's a crafting channel and it's a <gasps> and I swore. Uh oh. Yay, thank you. I keep forgetting to share it on my Facebook. I should go do that. I'll go do that. Um Let's see. Live dashboard. Uh, Facebook. Yeah, it's always it's, it's always, uh, post. Yay. Deep. And oh, and I that was on mine. That's um, share on a page you manage. Uh, post. Beep beep beep. Why don't you turn? Why did you turn on a sensor for the comments? Oh, <laughs> I, I get it. I'm I'm not smart some days. I think I need more coffee. I haven't had much today. <laughs> But it's so good to see you live, Brooke. I watched for a while, and then I started up the OBS, and then my computer kind of got stuck for a few minutes. I don't know what the heck it's doing, but... <sighs> calm, collected, calm, collected, whatever. Um, co coffee is... That, that... That is the worst swear word I've ever seen you say. Coffee is bad for you. What a such... T what? <laughs> Does this mean we're breaking up? Co coffee's good for my soul. I, I, I do not... I cannot... I cannot... Live without my coffee. And toast. I need to have toast. Oh... I gotta take some arthritis pills. Okay, I'm gonna start to book up and grab a coffee and then I'll be right back. I know. <laughs> but I'm gonna start up the book. Uh, it's uh, a spell.
spectral collie. Ooh. Um, by Ila, Ila, Ila. I don't know. You guys can read it. What the heck am I doing? You guys can see my screen. <laughs> I'm sharing the whole thing. Of course you can see it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start up the book and then, um, and, uh, grab myself a drink because I need to take my pills and I forgot to get a drink for it. Okay. Let's start this up. Let's see. Uh, the first book. Play. A Spectral Collie by Elia Wilkinson Petey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Spectral Collie by Elia Wilkinson Petey. Read by Michelle Chevalier, a.k.a. Beagle Mixtape. A spectral collie. William Percy Cecil happened to be a younger son, so he left home, which was England, and went to Kansas to ranch it. Thousands of younger sons do the same, only their destination is not invariably Kansas. An agent at Wichita picked out Cecil's farm for him and sent the deeds over to England before Cecil left. He said there was a house on the place. So Cecil's mother fitted him out for America just as she had fitted out another superfluous boy for Africa, and parted from him with the heroic front and big agonies of Mother Ache which she kept to herself. The boy bore up the way a man of his blood ought, but when he went out to the kennel to see Nita, his collie, he went to pieces somehow, and rolled on the grass with her in his arms, and wept like a booby. But the remarkable part of it was that Nita wept too, big hot dog tears, which her master wiped away. When he went off, she howled like a hungry baby, and had to be switched before she would give anyone a night's sleep. When Cecil got over on his Kansas place, he fitted up the shack as cozily as he could, and learned how to fry bacon and make soda biscuits. Incidentally, he did farming, and sunk a heap of money, finding out how not to do things. Meantime, the Americans laughed at him, and were inclined to turn the cold shoulder, and his compatriots of whom there were a number in the county, did not prove to his liking. They consoled themselves for their exiled state, in fashions not keeping with Cecil's traditions. His homesickness went deeper than theirs, perhaps, and American whiskey could not make up for the loss of his English home, nor flirtations with the gay American village girls quite compensate him for the loss of his English mother. So he kept to himself, and had nostalgia as some men have consumption. At length the loneliness got so bad that he had to see some living thing from home, or make a flunk of it and go back like a crybaby. He had a stiff pride still, though he sobbed himself to sleep more than one night, as many a pioneer has done before him. So he wrote home for Nita, the collie, and got word that she would be sent. Arrangements were made for her care all along the line, and she was properly boxed and shipped. As the time drew near for her arrival, Cecil could hardly eat. He was too excited to apply himself to anything. The day of her expected arrival, he actually got up at five o'clock to clean the house and make it look as fine as possible for her inspection. Then he hitched up and drove fifteen miles to get her. The train pulled out just as before he reached the station, so Nita in her box was waiting for him on the platform. He could see her in a queer way, as one sees the purple center of a revolving circle of light, for, to tell the truth, with the long ride in the morning sun and the beating of his heart, Cecil was only about half conscious of anything. He wanted to yell, but he didn't. He kept himself in hand and lifted up the sliding side of the box and called to Nita, and she came out. But it wasn't the man who fainted, though he might have done so being crazy homesick as he was, and half-fed and overworked while he was yet soft from an easy life. No, it was the dog. She looked at her master's face, gave one cry of inexpressible joy, and fell over in a real feminine sort of a faint, and had to be brought to like any other lady, with camphor and water and a few drops of spirit down her throat. Then Cecil got up on the wagon seat, and she sat beside him with her head on his arm and they rode home in absolute silence, 
each feeling too much for speech. After they reached home, however, Cecil showed her all over the place, and she barked out her ideas in glad sociability. After that, Cecil and Nita were inseparable. She walked beside him all day when he was out with the cultivator, or when he was mowing or reaping. She ate beside him at table, and slept across his feet at night. Evenings when he looked over the graphic from home, or read the books his mother sent him, that he might keep in touch with the world, Nita was beside him, patient but jealous. Then, when he threw his book or paper down, and took her on his knee and looked into her pretty eyes, or frolicked with her, she fairly laughed with delight. In short, she was faithful with that faith of which only a dog is capable that unquestioning faith to which even the most loving women never quite attain. However, fate was annoyed at this perfect friendship. It didn't give her enough to do, and fate is a restless thing with a horrible appetite for variety. So poor Nita died one day mysteriously, and gave her last look to Cecil as a matter of course, and he held her paws till the last moment, as a staunch friend should, and laid her away decently in a pine box in the cornfield, where he could be shielded from public view, if he chose to go there now and then, and sit beside her grave. He went to bed very lonely indeed the first night. The shack seemed to him to be removed endless miles from the other habitations of men. He seemed cut off from the world, and ached to hear the cheerful little barks which Nita had been in the habit of giving him by way of saying good night. Her amiable eye, with its friendly light, was missing. The gay wag of her tail was gone. All her ridiculous ways, at which he was never tired of laughing, were things of the past. He lay down, busy with these thoughts, yet so habituated to Nita's presence, that when her weight rested upon his feet, as usual, he felt no surprise. But after a moment it came to him that, as she was dead, the weight he felt upon his feet could not be hers. And yet there it was, warm and comfortable cuddling down in the familiar way. He actually sat up and put his hand down to the foot of the bed to discover what was there. But there was nothing there, save the weight. And that stayed with him that night and many nights after. It happened that Cecil was a fool, as men will be when they are young, and he worked too hard and didn't take proper care of himself, and so it came about that he fell sick with a low fever. He struggled around for a few days, trying to work it off, but one morning he awoke only to the consciousness of absurd dreams. He seemed to be on the sea, sailing for home, and the boat was tossing and pitching in a weary circle, and could make no headway. His heart was burning with impatience, but the boat went round and round in that endless circle till he shrieked out with agony. The next neighbors were the tailors, who lived two miles and a half away. They were awakened that morning by the howling of a dog before their door. It was a hideous sound and would give them no peace. So Charlie Taylor got up and opened the door, discovering there an excited little collie. Why, Tom, he called, I thought Cecil's collie was dead. She is, called back Tom. No, she ain't neither, for here she is, shaking like an aspen and a-begging me to go with her. Come out, Tom, and see. It was Nita, no denying, and the men, perplexed, followed her to Cecil's shack where they found him babbling. But that was the last of her. Cecil said he never felt her on his feet again. She had performed her final service for him, he said. The neighbors tried to laugh at the story at first, but they knew the tailors wouldn't take the trouble to lie, and as for Cecil, no one would have ventured to chaff him. End of A Spectral Collie by Elia Wilkinson Petey The Caller in the Night by Burton Klein. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett. The Caller in the Night by Burton Klein. By the side of a road which wanders in company of a stream across a region of Pennsylvania farmland that is called Paradise because of its beauty, you may still mark the ruins of a small brick cabin in the depths of a grove. 
In summertime ivy drapes its jagged fragments, and the pile might be lost to notice, but that at dusk the trembling leaves of the vine have a way of whispering to the nerves of your horse, and setting them too in a tremble. And the people in the village beyond have a belief that three troubled human beings lie buried under those ruins, and that at night, or in a storm, they sometimes cry aloud in their unrest. The village is Busselbury, and its people have a legend that on a memorable night there was once disclosed to a former inhabitant the secret of that ivied sepulchre. All the afternoon the two young women had chattered in the parlor, cooled by the shade of the portico, and lost to the heat of the day, to the few sounds of the village, to the passing hours themselves. Then, of a sudden, Mrs. Pollard was recalled to herself at the necessity of closing her front windows against a gust of wind that blew the curtains, like flapping flags, into the room. "'Sally, we're going to get it again,' she said, pausing for a glance at the horizon before she lowered the sash. "'Get what?' Her visitor walked to the other front window and stooped to peer out. Early evening clouds were drawing a black cap over the fair face of the land. I think we're going to have some more of old Screamer Mole this evening. I knew we should, after this hot— There, Margie, that was the expression I've been trying to remember all afternoon. You used it this morning. Where did you get such a poetic nickname for a thunder— Oh! For a second, noon had returned to the two women. From their feet, two long streaks of black shadow darted back into the room and vanished. Overhead, an octopus of lightning snatched the whole heavens in its grasp shook them, and disappeared. The two women screamed, and threw themselves on the sofa. Yet in a minute it was clear that the world still rolled on, and each looked at the other and laughed at her fright, till the prospect of an evening of storm sobered them both. "'Mercy!' Mrs. Pollard breathed in discouragement. "'We're in for another night of it. We've had this sort of thing for a week, and to-night, of all nights, when I wanted you to see this wonderful country under the moon—' Mrs. Pollard, followed by her guest, Mrs. Reeves, ventured to the window timidly again, to challenge what part of the sky they could see from under the great portico outside, and learn its portent for the night. An evil visage it wore, a swift change from a noonday of beaming calm. Now it was curtained completely with the blue-black cloud, which sent out mutterings, and then long brooding silences more ominous still, in their very concealment of the night's intentions. There was no defense against it but to draw down the blinds and shut out this angry gloom in the glow of the lamps within, and, with a half-hour of such glow to cause in them, the two women were soon merry again over their reminiscences, Mrs. Pollard at her embroidery, Mrs. Reeves at the piano, strumming something from Chopin in the intervals of their chatter. The girl fetched them their tea. Five already. Mrs. Pollard verified the punctuality of her servant with a glance at the clock. Then John will be away for another night. I do hope he won't try to get back this time. Night before last he left his assistant with a case, and raced his horse ten miles in the dead of the night to get home, Mrs. Pollard proudly reported, for fear I'd be afraid in the storm. And married four years, Mrs. Reeve smilingly shook her head in indulgence of such long-lived romance. In the midst of their cakes and tea the bell announced an impatient hand at the door. "'Well, speak of angels,' Mrs. Pollard quoted, and flew to greet her husband. But she opened the door upon smiling old Mr. Barber instead, from the precincts across the village street. Mr. Barber seemed to be embarrassed. "'I—I I rather thought you might be wanting something,' he said in words. By intention he was making apology for the night. "'I saw the doctor drive away, but I haven't seen him come back. So I—' I thought I'd just run over and see see if there wasn't something you wanted, he laughed uneasily. Mr. Barber's transparent diplomacy having been rewarded with tea, they all came at once to direct speech. It ain't going to amount to much, Mr. Barber insisted. Better come out, you ladies, and have a look around. It may rain a bit, but you'll feel easier if you come and get acquainted with things, so to say. And gathering their resolution, the two women followed him out onto the portico. They shuddered at what they saw. Night was at hand, two hours before its time. Nothing stirred, not a vocal cord of hungry, puzzled, frightened chicken or cow. The whole region seemed to have caught its breath, to be smothered under a pall of stillness, unbroken except for some occasional distant earthquake of thunder from the inverted Switzerland of cloud that hung pendant from the sky. 
Mr. Barber's emotions finally ordered themselves into speech as he watched. "'Ain't it grand?' he said. The two women made no reply. They sat on the steps to the portico, their arms entwined. The scene beat their more sophisticated intelligences back into silence. Some minutes they all sat there together, and then again Mr. Barber broke the spell. "'It do look fearful like. But you needn't be afraid. It's better to be friends with it, you might say, and then go to bed and forget it.' They thanked him for his goodness, bade him good-bye, and he clinked down the flags of the walk and started across the street. He got midway across when they all heard a startling sound, an unearthly cry. It came out of the distance and struck the stillness like a blow. "'What is it? What is it, Margie?' Mrs. Reeves whispered excitedly. Faint and quavering at its beginning, the cry grew louder and more shrill, and then died away, as the breath that made it ebbed and was spent. It seemed as if this unusual night had found at last a voice suited to its mood. Twice the cry was given, and then all was still as before. At its first notes the muscles in Mrs. Pollard's arm had tightened, but Mr. Barber had hastened back at once with reassurance. "'I guess Mrs. Pollard knows what that is,' he called to them from the gate. "'It's only our old friend Mole that lives down there in the notch. She gets lonesome every thunderstorm and lets it off like that. It's only her rheumatiz, I reckon. We wouldn't feel easy ourselves without them few kind words from old Mole.' The two women applauded as they could his effort toward humor. Then, "'Come on, Sally, quick!' Mrs. Pollard cried to her guest, and the two women bolted up the steps of the portico and flew like girls through the door, which they quickly locked between themselves and the disquieting night. Once safe within, relief from their nerves came at the simple effort of laughter, and an hour later, when it was clear that the stars still held to their courses, the two ladies were at their ease again, beneath the lamp on the table, with speech and conversation to provide an escape from thought. The night seemed to cool its high temper as the hours wore on, and gradually the storm allowed itself to be forgotten. Together, at bedtime, the two made their tour of the house, locking the windows and doors, and visiting the pantry on the way for an apple. Outside all was truly calm and still, as, with mock and exaggerated caution, they peered through one last open window. A periodic, lazy flash from the far distance was all that the sky could muster of its earlier wrath and they tripped upstairs and to bed, with that hilarity which always attends the feminine pursuit of repose. But in the night they were awakened. Not for nothing, after all, had the skies marshaled that afternoon a ray of their forces. Now they were as terribly vociferous as they had been terrifyingly still before. Leaves, that had drooped melancholy and motionless in the afternoon, were whipped from their branches at the snatch of the wind. The rain came down in a solid cataract. The thunder was a steady bombardment, and the frolic powers above, that had toyed and practiced with soundless flashes in the afternoon, had grown wanton at their sport, and hurled their electric shots at earth in appallingly accurate marksmanship. Between the flashes from the sky, the steady glare of a burning barn here and there reddened the blackness. The village dead, under the pelted sod, must have shuddered at the din. Even the moments of lull were saturate with terrors. In them rose audible the roar of waters, the clatter of frightened animals, the rattle of gates, the shouts of voices, the click of heels on the flags of the streets, as the villagers hurried to the succor of neighbors fighting fires out on the hills. For long afterward the tempest of that night was remembered. For hours while it lasted, trees were toppled over, and houses rocked to the blast. And for as long as it would, the rain beat in through an open window and wetted the two women where they lay in their bed, afraid to stir, even to help themselves, gripped in a paralysis of terror. Their nerves were not the more disposed to peace either, by another token of the storm. All through the night, since their waking, in moments of stillness sufficient for it to be heard, they had caught that cry of the late afternoon. Doggedly it asserted itself against the uproar. It insisted upon being heard. It too wished to shriek relievingly, like the inanimate night, and publish its sickness abroad. They heard it far off at first, but it moved and came nearer. Once the two women quaked when it came to them, shrill and clear, from a point close at hand. But they bore its invasion along with the wind and the rain, and lay shameless and numb in the rude arms of the night. 
They lay so till deliverance from the hideous spell came at last, in a vigorous pounding at the front door. "'It's John!' Mrs. Pollard cried in her joy, and through such a storm. She slipped from the bed, threw a damp blanket about her, and groped her way out of the room and down the stair, her guest stumbling after. They scarcely could fly fast enough down the dark steps. At the bottom Mrs. Pollard turned brighter the dimly burning entry lamp, shot back the bolt with fingers barely able to grasp it in their eagerness, and threw open the door. "'John!' she cried. But there moved into the house the tall and thin but heavily framed figure of an old woman who peered about in confusion. In a flash of recognition Mrs. Pollard hurled herself against the intruder to thrust her out. "'No,' the woman said. "'No, you will not, on such a night.' and the apparition herself, looking with feverish curiosity at her unwilling hostesses, slowly closed the door and leaned against it. Mrs. Pollard and her friend turned to fly, in a mad instinct to be anywhere behind a locked door. Yet before the instinct could reach their muscles, the unbidden visitor stopped them again. No, she said. I am dying. Help me. The two women turned, as if hypnotically obedient to her command. Their tongues lay thick and dead in their mouths. They fell into each other's arms, and their caller stood looking them over with the same fevered curiosity. Then she turned her deliberate scrutiny to the house itself. In a moment she almost reassured them with a first token of being human and feminine. On the table by the stairs lay a book, and she went and picked it up. Fine, she mused. Then her eye traveled over the pictures on the walls. Fine, she said. So this is the inside of a fine house. But suddenly, as her peering gaze returned to the two women, she was recalled to herself. But you wanted to put me out. On a night like this. Hear it. For a moment she looked at them in frank hatred, and on an impulse she revenged herself upon them by sounding, in their very ears, the shrill cry they had heard in the afternoon and through the night, that had mystified the villagers for years from the grove. The house rang with it, and with the hard peal of laughter that finished it. All three of them stood there, for an instant, viewing each other. But at the end of it, the weakest of them was the partly sibylline, partly mountebank intruder. She swayed back against the wall. Her head rolled limply to one side, and she moaned, "'Oh, God, how tired I am to-night!' Frightened as they still were, their runaway hearts beating a tattoo that was almost inaudible, the two other women made a move to support her, but she waved them back with a suddenly returning air of command. No, she said, you wanted to put me out. The creature wore some sort of thin skirt whose color had vanished in the blue-black of its wetness. Over her head and shoulders was thrown a ragged piece of shawl. From under it dangled strands of grizzled gray hair. Her dark eyes were hidden in the shadows of her impromptu hood. The hollows of her cheeks looked deeper in its shadows. She loosed the shawl from her head, and it dropped to the floor, disclosing a face like one of the fates. She folded her arms, and there was a rude majesty in the massive figure and its bearing as she tried to command herself and speak. I come here, in this storm. Hear it. Hear that. I want shelter. I want comfort. And what do you say to me? Well, then I take comfort from you. You thought I was your husband. You called his name. Well, I saw him this afternoon. He drove out. I called to him from the roadside. Let me tell your fortune, only fifty cent. But he whipped up his horse and drove away. You are all alike. But I see him now, in Woodman's Narrows. It rains there, same as here. Thunder and lightning, same as here. Trees fall, the wind blows. The wind blows. The woman had tilted her head and fixed her eyes, shining and eager, as if on some invisible scene, and she half intoned her words as if in a trance. I see your husband now. His wagon is smashed by a tree. The horse is dead. Your husband lies very still. He does not move. There! She turned to them, alert again to their presence. There is the husband that you want. If you don't believe me, all I say is, wait, he is there, you will see. She ended in a peal of laughter, 
which itself ended in a weary moan. Oh, why can't you help me? She came toward them, her arms outstretched. Don't be afraid of me. I want a woman to know me, to comfort me. I die tonight. It's calling me outside. Don't you hear? Listen to me, you women, she went on, and tried to smile to gain their favor. I lied to you to get even with you. You want your husband. Well, I lied. He isn't dead. For all you tried to shut me out. Do you never pity? Do you never help? Oh, oh! Her hand traveled over her brow, and her eyes wandered. No one knows what I need now. I got to tell it. I got to tell it. Hear that? There had been a louder and nearer crash outside. That's my warning. That says I got to tell it before it's too late. No storm like this for forty years, not since one night forty years ago. My God, that night! Another heavy rumble interrupted her. Yes, yes! She turned and called. I'll tell it, I promise! She came toward her audience and said pleadingly, Listen, even if it frightens you, you've got to listen. That night, forty years ago, she peered about her cautiously, I think, I think I hurt two people, hurt them very bad. And ever since that night, the two women had once again tried to fly away, but again she halted them. Listen, you have no right to run away. You got to comfort me. You hear? Please, please don't go. She smiled, and so seemed less ugly. What could her two auditors do but cling to each other and hear her, though dumb and helpless beneath her spell? Only wait. I'll tell you quickly. Oh, I was not always like this. Once I could talk. Elegant, too. I've almost forgotten now. But I never looked like this then. I was not always ugly. No teeth, gray hair. Once I was beautiful, too. You laugh? But yes. Ah, I was young and tall and had long black hair. I was Molly then. Molly Morgan. That's the first time I've said my name for years. But that's who I was. Ask Bruce. He knows. She had fallen back against the wall again, her eyes roaming as she remembered. Here she laughed. But Bruce is dead these many years. He was my dog. A long pause. We played together, among the flowers, in the pretty cottage under the vines, not far from here, but all gone now, all gone. Even the woods are gone the woods where Bruce and I hunted berries, and my mother. Again the restless hand sought the face and covered it. My mother, almost as young as I, and how she could talk. A fine lady, as fine as you. And, oh, we had good times together, nearly always. Sometimes mother got angry, in a rage. She'd strike me and say I was an idiot like my father. The next minute she'd hug me and cry and beg me to forgive her. It all comes back to me. Those were the days when she'd bake a cake for supper, the days when she cried and put on a black dress. But mostly she wore the fine dresses, all bright and soft and full of flowers. Oh, how she would dance about in those, sometimes, and always laughed when I stared at her, and say I was Ned's girl to my fingertips, I never understood what she meant. Then. The shrill speaker of a moment before had softened suddenly. The creature of the woods sniffed eagerly this atmosphere of the house, and faint vestiges of a former personage returned to her, summoned along with the scene she had set herself to recall. But, oh, how good she was to me, and read to me, and taught me to read, and careful of me? Ha! Never let me go alone to the village. Said I was too good for such a place. Some day we would go back to the world, whatever she meant by that. Said people there would clap the hands when they saw me, more than they had clapped the hands for her. Once she saw a young man walk along the road with me. Oh, how she beat my head when I came home. Nearly killed me she was so angry. Said I mustn't waste myself on such trash. My mother... I never understood her then. 
She used to tell me stories about New York and Philadelphia, many big cities. There they applaud and clap the hands when my mother was a queen or a beggar girl in the theater and make love and kill and fight, have grand supper in hotel afterward, and I'd ask my mother how soon I too may be a queen, and she'd give me to learn the words they say, and I'd say them. Then she'd clap me on the head again and tell me, Oh, you're Ned's girl. You're a blockhead, just like your father. And I'd say, Where is my father? Why does he never come? And after that, my mother would always sit quiet and never answer when I talked. And then she'd be kind again and make me proud and tell me I'm a very fine lady and have fine blood. And she'd talk about the day when we'd go back to the world and she'd buy me pretty things to wear. But I thought it was fine where we were, there in the cottage, I with the flowers and Bruce. In those days, yes. The woman sighed and left them to silence for a space, for silent seemed the wind and the rain on the breaking of her speech. A rumble from without started her on again. Yes, yes, I'm telling. I'll hurry. Then I grow big, seventeen. My mother called me her little giantess, her handsome darling, her conceited fool, all at the same time. I never understood my mother. Then. But then, one day, it came. The woman pressed her fingers against her eyes, as if to shut out the vision her mind was preparing. Everything changed then. Everything was different. No more nights with stories and books. No more about New York and Philadelphia. Never again. I was out in the yard one day, on my knees, with the flowers. It was springtime, and I was digging and fixing, and I heard a horse's hoofs on the road. A runaway, I thought at first. I stood up to look, and— She faltered and then choked out. I stood up to look, and the man came. And with the words came a crash that rocked the house. Hear that! The woman almost shrieked. That's him! That's the man! I hear him in every storm. He came, she went on more rapidly, a tall man, fine, dressed in fine clothes, brown hair, brown eyes. Oh, I often see those brown eyes. I know what they are like. He came riding along the by-road. When he caught sight of my mother, he almost fell from his horse. The horse nearly fell. The man pulled him in so sham. Good God, the man said. Fanny, is this where you are? Curse you, old girl, is this where you are? funny how I remember his words, and then he came in. And he talked to my mother a long time, then he looked round and said, So this is where you've crawled to. And he petted Bruce. And then he came to me, and looked into my face a long time, and said, So this is his girl, eh? Fanny Junior, down to the last eyelash. Come here, puss, he said, and I made a face at him. And he put his hands to his sides and laughed and laughed at me. And he turned to my mother and said, Fanny, Fanny, what a queen. I thought he meant be a queen in the theater, but he meant something else. He came to me again and squeezed me and pressed his face against mine. And my mother ran and snatched him away, and I ran behind the house. And by and by my mother came to find me and said, Oh, oh my little giantess, so here you are. What are you trembling for? And she kicked me. Take that, she said. And I didn't understand, not then. But I understand now. Next day the man came again and talked to my mother, but I saw him look and look at me, and by and by he reached for my hand, and my mother said, Stop that. None of that, my little George. One at a time, if you please. And he laughed and let me go, and they went out and sat on a bench in the yard, and the man stroked my mother's hair, and I watched and listened. They talked a long time till it was night, and I heard George say, Well, Fanny, old girl, we did for him all right, didn't we? I've always remembered it, and they laughed and they laughed. Then the man said, God, how it does scare me sometimes. And my mother laughed at him for that, and George said, Look what I've had to give up and you pinned up here. But never mind, it will blow over. Then we'll crawl back to the old world, eh, Fanny?"
All this the woman had rattled off like a child with a recitation, as something learned long ago and long rehearsed, against just this last contingency and confession. "'Oh, I remember it,' she said, as if her volubility needed an explanation. "'It took me a long time to understand, but one day I understood.' He came often then, George did, and I was not afraid of him any more. He was fine, like my mother. Every time I saw him come my stomach would give a jump, and I liked to have him put his face against mine the way I'd seen him do to mother. And every time he went away I'd watch him from the hilltop till I couldn't see him any more, and at night I couldn't sleep, and George came very often to see me, he told me, and not my mother. And my mother was changed then. She never hit me again, because George said he'd kill her if she did. But she acted very strange when he told her that, and looked and looked at me, and didn't speak to me for days and days. But I didn't mind. I could talk to George. And we'd go for long walks, and he'd tell me more about New York and Phil Delph, more than my mother could tell. Oh, I loved to hear him talk. And he said such nice things to me, such nice things to me. Bruce... I forgot all about Bruce. Oh, I was happy, but that was because I knew nothing. Yes, I pleased George, but by and by he changed, too. Then I couldn't say anything that he liked. Stupid child, he called me. I tried ever so hard to please him, but it was like walking against a wind that you can't push aside. You women, you just guess how I felt then. You just guess. You want your husband. It was the same with me. I want George. But he wouldn't listen to me no more. The woman seemed to sink, to shrivel under the weight of her recollection. Finding her not a monster but a woman, after all, her two hearers were moved to another slight token of sympathy. They were guessing, as she commanded. But still, with a kind of weary magnanimity, she waved them back, away from the things she had yet to make clear. But one day I saw it. One day I saw something. I came home with my berries, and George was there. His breath was funny, and he talked funny and walked funny. I'd seen people in the village that way. But my mother was that way, too. She looked funny, had very red cheeks, and talked very fast. Very foolish. And her breath was the same as George's. And she laughed and laughed at me and made fun of me. I said nothing. But I didn't sleep that night. I wondered what would happen. Many days I thought of what was happening. Then I knew. My mother was trying to get George away from me. That was what had happened. Another day I came back with my berries, and my mother was not there. Neither was George there. So, she had taken George away. My George. Well. I set out to look. No rest for me till I find them. I knew pretty well where they might be. I started for George's little brick house down in the hollow. That's where he had taken to living, hunting and fishing. It was late. The brick house was far away. I was very tired, but I went, and... She had been speaking more rapidly. Here she stopped to breathe, to swallow, to collect herself for the final plunge. I heard a runaway horse. George's horse, I said. George is coming back to me, after all. George is coming back to me. She can't keep him. And yes, it was George's horse, but nobody on him. I was so scared I could hardly stand. Something had happened to George. Only then did I know how much I wanted him, when something had happened to him. I almost fell down in the road, but I crawled on, and presently I came to him, to George. He was walking in the road, limping and stumbling and rolling, all muddy, singing to himself. He didn't know me at first. I ran to him, to my George. And he grabbed me, and stumbled and fell. And he grabbed my ankle. "'Come to me, little one,' he said. "'Damn the old hag,' he said. "'It's the girl I want. Ned's own,' he said. "'Come here to me. Ned's own. I want you.' And he pinched me. He bit my hand. And—and and I— All of a sudden I was afraid. And I snatched myself loose. George, I screamed. No, I said. I don't know why. I was very scared. I was wild. I kicked away and ran, ran, ran away. I don't know where. To the woods. And oh, a long time I heard George laugh at me. 
just like the very old Ned, I heard him shout. But I ran, till I fell down, tired, and there I sat and thought. And all of a sudden I understood. All at once I knew many things. I knew then what my mother had said about Ned sometimes. He was my father. He was dead. Somebody had killed him, I knew. I knew it from what they said. George knew my father then, too. What did he know? That was it. He, he was the man that killed my father. He was after my mother then. He had been after her before, and made her breathe funny, made a fool of her. That was why my beautiful mother was so strange to me sometimes. That's why there was no more New York and Philadelphia. George did that, spoiled everything. Now he was back, making a fool of her again, my mother, and wanted to make a fool of me. Oh, then I knew, that man. And I had liked him. His brown hair, his brown eyes, but oh, I understood. I understood. I got up from the ground. Everything reeled and fell apart. There was nothing more for me. Everything spoiled. Our pretty cottage, the stories, all gone. Spoiled. So I ran back. Maybe I could bring my mother back. Maybe I could save something. Oh, I was sick. The trees, they bent and rolled the way George walked. The wind bent them double. They held their stomachs as if they were George laughing at me. They seemed to holler, Ned's girl, at me. I was dizzy, and the wind nearly blew me over, but I had to hurry home. I got near. No one there. Not even George. But I had to find my beautiful little mother. All round I ran. The brambles threw me down. I fell over a stump and struck my face. I could feel the blood running down over my cheeks. It was warmer than the rain. No matter. I had to find my mother. My poor little mother. Bruce growled at me when I got to the house. He didn't know me. That's how I looked. But there was a light in the house. Yes, my mother was there. But George was there, too. That man. They had bundles all ready to go away. They weren't glad to see me. I got there too soon. George said, Damn her soul, always that girl of Ned's. I'll show her. And he kicked me. George kicked me. But my mother, she didn't laugh when she saw me. She was very scared. She shook George and said, George, come away, quick. Look at her face. Look at her eyes, she said. Oh, my mother, my little mother. She thought I would hurt her. Even when she'd been such a fool, I was the one that had to take care of her then. But she wanted to go away with that man. That made me wild. You, George, I said. You've got to go. You've... You've done too much to us, I said. You go. And, Mother, I said, you've got to leave him. He's done too much to us, I said. She only answered, George, come, quick. And she dragged George toward the door. And George laughed at me, laughed and laughed, till he saw my eyes. He didn't laugh then, nor my mother. My mother screamed when she saw my eyes. Shut up, George, she screamed. She's not Ned's girl now. And George said, No, by God, she's your brat now, all right. She's the devil's own. And they ran for the door. I tried to get there first to catch my little mother. My mother only screamed as if she were wild. And they got out, out in the dark. Mother, I cried, Mother, come back, come back. No answer. My mother was gone. Oh, that made me feel, somehow, very strong. I'll bring you back, I shouted. You, George, I'll send you away. Wait and see. They never answered. Maybe they never heard. The wind was blowing like tonight. But I knew where I could find them. I knew where to go to find George. And I ran to my loft for my knife. But, oh, my God, when I saw poor Molly in the glass, teeth gone, I wasn't beautiful any more. And my eyes, they came out of the glass at me, like two big dogs jumping a fence. I ran from them. I didn't know myself. I ran out of the door in the night. I went after that man. He had done too much. That storm, the lightning that night, awful. But no storm kept me back. Rain, hail, 
but I kept on. Trees fell, but I went on. I called out. I laughed then myself. I'll get him, I say. Look out for Ned's girl. Look out for Ned's girl, I say. Unconsciously the woman was reenacting every gesture, repeating every phrase and accent of her journey through the night, that excursion out of the world from which there had been no return for her. Look out for Ned's girl! The house rang with the cry, but this second journey of the memory ended in a moon and a faint. I said I would tell it. Help me, she said. In some fashion they worked her heavy bulk out of its crazy wrappings and into a bed. John arrived to help them. Morning peered timidly over the eastern hills, as if fearful of beholding what the night had wrought. In its smiling calm the noise of the storm was already done away, but the storm in the troubled mind raged on. For days it raged in fever and delirium. Then they buried the rude minister of justice in the place where she commanded, under the pile of broken stones and bricks among the trees in the hollow. And it is said that the inquisitive villagers who had a part in the simple ceremonies stirred about till they made the discovery of two skeletons under the ruins, and to this day there are persons in Bustlebury with a belief that at night, or in a storm, they sometimes hear a long-drawn cry issuing from that lonely little hollow. End of The Caller in the Night by Burton Klein Yeah, I figured it out. Ooh, 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 baby. See that? See that? I got my Etsy to show up. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, I got my Etsy to show up. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. <laughs> I'm not being foolish at all. I got it to show up. And I knew there was something. I ended up. I had my blog all done up and it was looking great and it was awesome and it was great and awesome and um, something happened and something got corrupt and it started it stopped so I lost some of the code uh, when it corrupted and so I ended up uh, having to um, I said S screw it and um, I had all the code with me I guess I had the, all the code but I had to recompile it and do it up again so now I'm doing up this reference file so that I can just file save um, then I just have it all there and as this um, is this reference file so that I don't if something happens I don't have to um, worry about it again it's all fixed up it doesn't have to um, like I don't have to do anything to fix it up I just copy and paste stuff in and then you know if I'm doing up a new page I can just pull out the code that I want most of it is even set up in the colors for my different sites Except for these, I have to fix that, but that'll be just something I fiddle with at some point. Um, so, you know, just to do some of the stuff. And all this is done with code. Most of it's, there's barely anything that's not code in here. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty cool. And I've uh, set it up. Let's see. I've set it up with the little thingy here. It's just, you know, my index. And it just brings you to here. This is the code to get the, the Facebook app going up. Um, but this one will open up to my my messenger for Creation Spina Dean. Yay! And then um, Newfoundland Atheist and then mine. Yay! 
That's my um, photography page and not my regular one. I'll have to do it on my regular one too because I, I can do it with Facebook.me for it. Um, but yeah, and then this is the site colors. So that's my main color for Creations by Nadine is, is C57DEF. That one right here. And that's what everything, that's what all my borders is and all my fonts and all this kind of stuff. I figured it goes well with the bracelet. So yeah. So this is, I, I did all this so that it would, uh, oops, that's the, there we go. Um, so it'd be easy for me to, and these are all buttons and figuring out how to make it so the buttons look animated and stuff. You know, the links. Uh, even though they, even though they that shouldn't go to the HTML color picker, but that's okay. That should uh, I'd copy the code from the uh, from the from this part, so I have to just have to change that code um, and to make the text all glow and stuff. It's in, but I couldn't figure out what I wasn't doing right with this code, and like of course I didn't build it, but. Um, uh, Etsy provides it for you, but it's an old code, and uh, you have to do a little bit of ed editing to it to work, to get it to work. So, um, yay, fun stuff! Oh, no, no, I'm not counting down till Josiah gets here. Not at all. <laughs> no. And not not in any way, uh, shape or form. And he must be he must be really bit bitty badly there. Josiah must be really busy since he hasn't um, come by. Oops. Yeah, he says he's slammed. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it only has this option. See, it, you can go on this site. It's timeanddate.com, and it's got the countdown timer. And um, so it's got all kinds of thingies. And then you can just put your event name in there, and you pick your font style. I picked the cursive, I guess. And then you just put in a day and a month. And then you can pick... Weeks, days, hours, minutes, seconds, and that's the one that I used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no Josiah. And, and I'm glad to see you. Like, it was so nice to see you on your stream and that. And <laughs> Oh, you got caught. <laughs> Yeah, Josiah says he's he's slammed. And I'm gonna put on another book. Um yeah, drafting I'm I'm uh, glad to see ya. It's nice nice for for you to come by and and Brooke, she hasn't been by much either. <laughs> Yeah, I saw your, I had my reminder set up to, to remind me to start my own stream, and then it, your beep come up, and I'm like, oh no, what do I do, I'm late for my own stream, and then, um, somebody's, somebody's following me, um, but yeah, so, 
and like I said, I lost my blog, so I'm just saying screw it and I'm just going to coat it outside and plunk it in. Awesome. You have a wonderful night drafting. And I, and I was really glad to have you by. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> it's been it's been rough. The the weather's been bad and my back's been really hurting and oh thinking about that, I go on Thursday afternoon. I go Thursday afternoon to the doctors to find my results about my back scan and, and all that kinda stupid stuff so hopefully hopefully I'll uh, I'll be able to get treatment for for the arthritis that I think I have cuz I'm I'm like like 99% sure I've got arthritis in me back and and uh I just wish Art would come hurry up and come by and take his arthritis away um but of course, knowing the kind that you have is the only way you can treat the stuff. You know, that's just kind of the way life is, eh? So, um, yeah. But I'm glad to I'm glad to have you by drafting. And Brooke, <laughs> I've missed you too. And and uh, your your uh, uh, the the oh for flip's sake, Nadine, the um. The jackpot down for the for the draw is really really big right now apparently, and uh, Josiah's getting slammed at work. So um. Oh, I know um. Like I said, I've been trying. I've been trying to figure out how to get the recordings going and stuff, and in the the streaming on my regular channel going. Um, but I I can't get the um, I can't get uh, OBS running correctly. Like it's taking up too much processing power. So when I record videos. It chokes so badly. It's crazy. It's because I can't use you know in uh, Linux. I can't use the um, video driver. Now I did do something today. I learned some new stuff today, and hopefully, cross the fingers. Cross the fingers. Cross all the hairs too. Cross all the hairs too. And um, hopefully. Uh, a bunch of stuff updated, and it was all AMD stuff, or most of it. So, after this, I'm going to check, because it wasn't long before this that I updated everything. So, I'm going to check and see if uh, I can hook up, because I never thought about it before I started the stream. Um, uh, Iowans Live, did you want to play another... The final book, or um, did you want to go and watch Iowan? There's one more book that I was doing today. This one's done, and this one's done. It's 14 minutes. I think I'm just going to play that book. The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. Years before the accession of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, and yet at not so remote a date as to be utterly beyond the period to which the reminiscences of our middle-aged readers extend, it happened that two English gentlemen sat at a table on a summer's evening, after dinner, quietly sipping their wine and engaged in desultory conversation. They were both men known to fame. 
One of them was a sculptor, whose statues adorned the palaces of princes, and whose chiseled busts were the pride of half the nobility of his nation. The other was no less renowned as an anatomist and surgeon. The age of the anatomist might have been guessed at fifty, but the guess would have erred on the side of youth by at least ten years. That of the sculptor could scarcely be more than five and thirty. A bust of the anatomist, so admirably executed as to present, although in stone, the perfect similitude of life and flesh, stood upon a pedestal opposite to the table at which sat the pair, and at once explained at least one connecting link of companionship between them. The anatomist was exhibiting for the criticism of his friend a rare gem which he had just drawn from his cabinet. It was a crucifix, magnificently carved in ivory, and encased in a setting of pure gold. "'The carving, my dear sir,' observed Mr. Phidias, the sculptor, "'is indeed, as you say, exquisite. The muscles are admirably made out, the flesh well modelled, wonderfully so for the size and material, and yet, by the by, on this point you must know more than I, the more I think upon the matter, the more I regard the artistic conception as utterly false and wrong. You speak in a riddle, replied Dr. Carnell, but pray go on and explain. It is a fancy I first had in my student days, replied Phidias. Conventionality, not to say a most proper and becoming reverence, prevents people by no means ignorant from considering the point. But once think upon it, and you at least, of all men, must at once perceive how utterly impossible it would be for a victim nailed upon a cross by hands and feet to preserve the position invariably displayed in figures of the crucifixion. Those who so portray it fail in what should be their most awful and agonizing effect. Think for one moment, and imagine, if you can, what would be the attitude of a man, living or dead, under this frightful torture? "'You startle me,' returned the great surgeon, "'not only by the truth of your remarks, but by their obviousness. "'It is strange indeed that such a matter should have so long been overlooked. "'The more I think upon it, the more the bare idea of actual crucifixion seems to horrify me, "'though heaven knows I am accustomed enough to scenes of suffering. "'How would you represent such a terrible agony?' "'Indeed I cannot tell,' replied the sculptor. "'To guess would be almost vain.' the fearful strain upon the muscles, their utter helplessness and inactivity, the frightful swellings, the effect of weight upon the racked and tortured sinews, appall me too much even for speculation. But this, replied the surgeon, one might think a matter of importance, not only to art, but higher still, to religion itself. Maybe so, returned the sculptor but perhaps the appeal to the senses through a true representation might be too horrible for either the one or the other. Still, persisted the surgeon, I should like, say, for curiosity, though I am weak enough to believe even in my own motive as a higher one, to ascertain the effect from actual observation. So should I, could it be done, and of course without pain to the object, which, as a condition, seems to present at the outset an impossibility." "'Perhaps not,' mused the anatomist. "'I think I have a notion. "'Stay. "'We may contrive this matter. "'I will tell you my plan, "'and it will be strange indeed "'if we two cannot manage to carry it out.' "'The discourse here, "'owing to the rapt attention of both speakers, "'assumed a low and earnest tone, "'but had perhaps better be narrated "'by a relation of the events "'to which it gave rise. "'Suffice it to say that the sovereign "'was more than once mentioned during its progress,' and in a manner which plainly told that the two speakers each possessed sufficient influence to obtain the assistance of royalty, and that such assistance would be required in their scheme. The shades of evening deepened while the two were still conversing, and, leaving this scene, let us cast one hurried glimpse at another taking place contemporaneously. Between Pimlico and Chelsea, and across a canal of which the bed has since been used for the railway terminating at Victoria Station, there was, at the time of which we speak, a rude timber footway, long since replaced by a more substantial and convenient erection, but then known as the Wooden Bridge. It was named shortly afterward Cutthroat Bridge, and for this reason. While Mr. Phidias and Dr. Carnell were discoursing over their wine, as we have already seen, one Peter Stark, a drunken Chelsea pensioner, was murdering his wife upon the spot we have last indicated. The coincidence was curious. 
In those days, the punishment of criminals followed closely upon their conviction. The Chelsea pensioner whom we have mentioned was found guilty one Friday, and sentenced to die on the following Monday. He was a sad scoundrel, impenitent to the last, glorying in the deeds of slaughter which he had witnessed and acted during the series of campaigns which had ended just previously at Waterloo. He was a tall, well-built fellow enough, of middle age, for his class was not then, as now, composed chiefly of veterans, but comprised many young men, just sufficiently disabled to be unfit for service. Peter Stark, although but slightly wounded, had nearly completed his term of service, and had obtained his pension and presentment to Chelsea Hospital. With his life we have but little to do, save as regards its close, which we shall shortly endeavor to describe far more voraciously, and at some greater length than set forth in the brief account which satisfied the public of his own day, and which, as embodied in the columns of the few journals then appearing, ran thus. On Monday, Peter Stark was executed at Newgate for the murder at the Wooden Bridge, Chelsea, with four others for various offenses. After he had been hanging only for a few minutes, a respite arrived, but although he was promptly cut down, life was pronounced to be extinct. His body was buried within the prison walls. Thus far history. But the conciseness of history far more frequently embodies falsehood than truth. Perhaps the following narration may approach more nearly to the facts. A room within the prison had been, upon that special occasion and by high authority, allotted to the use of Dr. Carnell and Mr. Phidias, the famous sculptor, for the purpose of certain investigations connected with art and science. In that room Mr. Phidias, while wretched Peter Stark was yet swinging between heaven and earth, was busily engaged in arranging a variety of implements and materials, consisting of a large quantity of plaster of Paris, two large pails of water, sonic tubs, and other necessaries of the molder's art. The room contained a large deal table, and a wooden cross, not neatly planed and squared at the angles, but of thick, narrow, rudely sawn oaken plank, fixed by strong, heavy nails. And while Mr. Phidias was thus occupied, the executioner entered, bearing upon his shoulders the body of the wretched Peter, which he flung heavily upon the table. "'You are sure he is dead?' asked Mr. Phidias. "'Dead as a herring,' replied the other, "'and yet just as warm and limp as if he had only fainted.' "'Then go to work at once,' replied the sculptor, as, turning his back upon the hangman, he resumed his occupation. The work was soon done. Peter was stripped and nailed upon the timber, which was instantly propped against the wall. "'As fine a one as ever I see,' exclaimed the executioner, as he regarded the defunct murderer with an expression of admiration, as if at his own handiwork, in having abruptly demolished such a magnificent animal." "'Drops a good bit forward, though. Shall I tie him up round the waist, sir?' "'Certainly not,' returned the sculptor. "'Just rub him well over with this oil, especially his head, and then you can go. Dr. Carnell will settle with you.' "'All right, sir.' The fellow did as ordered, and retired without another word, leaving this strange couple, the living and the dead, in that dismal chamber. Mr. Phidias was a man of strong nerve in such matters. He had been too much accustomed to taking posthumous casts to trouble himself with any sentiment of repugnance at his approaching task of taking what is called a peace-mold from a body. He emptied a number of bags of the white powdery plaster of Paris into one of the larger vessels, poured it into a pail of water, and was carefully stirring up the mass when a sound of dropping arrested his ear. Drip! Drip! "'There's something leaking,' he muttered as he took a second pail, and emptying it, again stirred the composition. Drip, drip, drip. "'It's strange,' he soliloquized, half aloud. "'There is no more water, and yet—' The sound was heard again. He gazed at the ceiling. There was no sign of damp. He turned his eyes to the body, and something suddenly caused him a violent start. The murderer was bleeding. The sculptor, spite of his command over himself, turned pale. At that moment the head of Stark moved, clearly moved. It raised itself convulsively for a single moment, its eyes rolled, and it gave vent to a subdued moan of intense agony. Mr. Phidias fell fainting on the floor as Dr. Carnell entered. 
It needed but a glance to tell the doctor what had happened, even had not Peter just then given vent to another low cry. The surgeon's measures were soon taken. Locking the door, he bore a chair to the wall which supported the body of the malefactor. He drew from his pocket a cease of glittering instruments, and with one of these, so small and delicate that it scarcely seemed larger than a needle, he rapidly, but dexterously and firmly, touched Peter just at the back of the neck. There was no wound larger than the head of a small pin, and yet the head fell instantly as though the heart had been pierced. The doctor had divided the spinal cord, and Peter Stark was dead indeed. A few minutes sufficed to recall the sculptor to his senses. He at first gazed wildly upon the still-suspended body, so painfully recalled to life by the rough vinisection of the hangman and the subsequent friction of anointing his body to prevent the adhesion of the plaster. "'You need not fear now,' said Dr. Carnell. "'I assure you he is dead.' "'But he was alive, surely.' "'Only for a moment, and even that scarcely to be called life. Mere muscular contraction, my dear sir, mere muscular contraction.' The sculptor resumed his labor. The body was girt at various circumferences with fine twine, to be afterward withdrawn through a thick coating of plaster, so as to separate the various pieces of the mold, which was at last completed, and after this Dr. Carnell skillfully flayed the body to enable a second mold to be taken of the entire figure, showing every muscle of the outer layer. The two molds were thus taken. It is difficult to conceive more ghastly appearances than they presented. For sculptor's work they were utterly useless for no artist except the most daring of realists would have ventured to indicate the horrors which they presented. Phidias refused to receive them. Dr. Carnell, hard and cruel as he was, for kindness' sake, in his profession, was a gentle father of a family of daughters. He received the castes, and at once consigned them to a garret, to which he forbade access. His youngest daughter, one unfortunate day, during her father's absence, was impelled by feminine curiosity, perhaps a little increased by the prohibition, to enter the mysterious chamber. Whether she imagined in the pallid figure upon the cross a celestial rebuke for her disobedience, or whether she was overcome by the mere mortal horror of one or both of those dreadful castes, can now never be known. But this is true, she became a maniac. The writer of this has more than once seen, as no doubt have many others, the plaster effigies of Peter Stark, after their removal from Dr. Carnell's to a famous studio near the Regent's Park. It was there that he heard whispered the strange story of their origin. Sculptor and surgeon are now both long since dead, and it is no longer necessary to keep the secret of the two plaster casts. End of The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. The Secret of the Two Plaster Casts Okay, it looks like we're all done now. Um, that was interesting. Um, book, Will, uh, I can throw this together. I can throw Hamlet together. We can listen to acts one at a time and uh, just listen to the when you're when you're available you know it doesn't have to be you know I can just throw it together whenever you're available the only time I wouldn't be available is when Josiah is here because I probably will probably do a stream with us together um, on both channels but um, yeah you know I probably won't be streaming a whole heck of a lot while he's here um, but yeah, I can certainly make time for for you to uh let's let's have a look. Hamlet. Hamlet. Um is this did this say dramatic? Well, we can we can do it live, I guess. It was, it was a, a battle for you and Josiah, and and I can uh, 
I, I can play darts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's which version would you like the dramatic or the um, I'm guessing the dramatic the, rather than the solo let's see so it's 3 hours and 53 minutes and 20 seconds so okay so you need an hour for act 1 uh, uh 45 for act 2, an hour for act 3, 40 for act 4, and 45 for act 5. So we can do, um, <laughs> well, and apparently no, uh, no Rachel, she's, she's got some pretty good, uh, moves going on there too, you know. <laughs> We can let dra drafting and Rachel, Ra Rachel get after it. That that could be interesting. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so you need you need about an hour for Act One. Um, so uh, message me on like direct message me like my account on Twitter rather than in Creation Spider Dean. But direct message me on Twitter whenever you want and just say the word and we can throw it together. Because I'll be doing something like this or I can do whatever, you know. So, um, so yeah, whenever you can, let me know. Yeah, just, just let me know. It will be, it'll work easier if you let me know. Uh, I, um... I don't get up until like 11 o'clock in the morning or so and uh, so I can you know pretty much any time after that and we can play as long as you want so you know if it turns out you have more than an hour's worth of time and you want to listen for longer yes absolutely get your homework done missy <laughs> Okay, thank you for coming by. I really appreciate it. And, and like I said, I'm so glad to see you in drafting here again. It was... I've missed you guys. I don't see drafting often, are you? I know he's been busy. I know. It's math. Get your homework done, Missy. <laughs> mind you what I tell ya. You mind me now. <laughs> and, um... Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get it done. You'll get it done. I'm sure you'll do wonderfully. You're, uh... <laughs> you better mind me. <laughs> I love you, honey. Um, and uh, to whoever, whoever else is still listening, thanks for coming by. I, I appreciate it. Uh, we're all done for the night. I just planned on doing the three... The three chapters while I fiddled and farted around with stuff. Um, losing that uh, bit of the website kind of set me a little bit behind, but you know, whatever. Now I can get up my my code nicer and, and get everything set up so that if I do um, lose everything, I can easily restore it instead of instead of uh, fiddling and farting around like I'm doing right now. It'll be so much easier. Okay. Um, I'll let you guys go. Uh, thanks for coming and have an absolutely wonderful night. Bye. Uh,